Well, you've been sitting for a while. You want to stand up for just a minute and stretch your legs? Uh, get ready for a real long sermon? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Um, want to sing anything? Or? No, maybe not. Okay. All right. We'll just uh, stretch, exercise, do a few calisthenics. Uh, yeah. Right, that's good. You want to give a report from Germany while we're waiting? Uh, from, greetings from Bob and Farrell. Yes. Kevin, why don't you do that while we're standing? Just, just give yeah. it. Uh, Bob and Carol just wanted to tell everybody hi, and uh, for us to bring their love to you. Yep. So. They miss you all, and uh, can't wait to see us all again. And um, they keep praying for us. They will be here. The 18th. The 18th. August. 18th. August. Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, for that sharing that report. These are important days in the life of your church, so certainly it's great to know that the church the gateway in Darmstadt is praying for you as well as uh, others of us who are deeply concerned about what God is doing here at Gateway here in Mayville. We have a guest with us. Ophelia is a friend of ours since Christmas Day, this past Christmas. Uh, she and some other friends from China joined us for dinner, and, and uh, we've remained friends. And um, I'm happy to share that she was baptized as a Christian about a month ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she'll be going back, so pray for her. She returns to her teaching post at the university in Shanghai. Her husband's also a professor there. And, uh, we pray that God will use her witness um, in China uh, for the good of the kingdom of God. It's great to have a friend like Ophelia and to see how the kingdom of God is growing, uh, as Jesus said, in sometimes um, secret ways, ways that many people don't know about. Okay, let's open our Bibles as we continue to look at what John, the Pastor John, says to the church about the assurances of faith in the light of inroads of false teaching in the light of difficulties in relationships within the church in this kind of a confusing atmosphere how are we as believers to be sure of our connection with God how can we know that we truly are converted uh, born again children of God children of the light and we noted a few weeks ago in the first chapter of first John how uh, that John says that we are children of the light. God is light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, we are the light of the world. So how can we know that we are true believers, children of the light? So John gives some very important tests. You've been sitting there filling out a form. You probably felt like you were taking a test. Well, John gives the church tests of assurance so that they can know that they have eternal life which is his purpose, as he says in chapter 5. And so he gives a test of, there'll be a transformation of your life. You'll become like Jesus Christ. You'll start becoming like him in your character. So there's the moral test. There's also the doctrinal test, that you're putting your faith in Jesus Christ and trusting in him as the God-man, the one who was sent into the world, God's only begotten son, to be our savior. You're trusting in him not in anything or anyone else. And then also he will give the love test. How are you relating to others? Are you expressing your love for God through your love for one another? And so this is a test we're going to look at specifically today in 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 7 through 11. So follow as I read. 1 John chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and in you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. 
Well, tests can be stressful. In fact, not just for students, but even teachers don't like to give tests because they have to grade them. They have to make an evaluation, and that takes a lot of time. I'm still taking tests at my age, believe it or not. In fact, this past fall, I had to take a test to get a driver's license. I've been out of the U.S. for too long. There's an eight-year limit, so we've been in Belgium for almost nine years. So we had to take, I had to take a new driver's test, a written test about Wisconsin laws, and then I had to take a driving test with a person sitting next to me evaluating how I can drive. And so fortunately, I was able to get a Wisconsin driver's license. I remember back in my student days, we would have classes that would always open with prayer. The professor himself would sometimes lead in the prayer, and sometimes he would ask one of the students to lead in the prayer uh, to begin uh, the test, just like you had prayer before you did your evaluation of the church. Well, he would call on someone to lead in prayer before the class was starting, so the student would pray Maybe there's somebody that's in the class that has a sick uh, member of their family or there's a special need, but particularly just to pray that God would guide them through that class period and teach them uh, what they needed to learn. Well, in this particular class session, when I was a student, uh, this, the professor opened the class and he asked one of the students to lead in prayer. And as he led in prayer, this is what he said, Dear Lord, uh, please help us now as we take this test and when he said the word test, a student in the back of the class immediately said, test? What test? And so the prayer was totally interrupted. And then finally, the prayer was able to continue and conclude his prayer. But obviously, there was a student in the class who didn't know about the test. He wasn't prepared for the test. And in the prayer, it was the first time that he heard that they were taking a test. Now. This is the kind of reaction, perhaps, that John was getting in the congregation. Test? You mean there's a test involved in the Christian life? You mean we're supposed to actually examine whether or not we truly are children of God? And so John says, yes. John says so as a teacher, pastor, who really cares about his students, however. He, he doesn't give tests just to torture his students. He gives tests to the churches to help them to understand where they stand with God, their relationship with God. Are they truly converted? This has eternal significance. It's not something that has to do with just some sort of measure of where you're getting along in your Christian life. It has to do with whether or not you're prepared for eternity. And so it's important that you take tests and examine yourself to see if you truly are in the kingdom of heaven. And so John gives his test, first of all, in verses 7 and 8. And he says, the test that I'm giving to you is both an old and a new test. Notice in those two verses, he begins by saying, I'm not writing a new command, this is an old command. But then he says in the next verse, yet I'm writing you a new command. It's both, old and new. I played football in college, and not all of my teammates were excellent students. They weren't recruited to play football because they were great students. They were recruited because they could play football. So some of them had a difficulty in the classroom and they had a genius, however, for finding teachers that were easy. And uh, some of the easy teachers would give old tests. And what they had to do only was to simply find a former student who had taken that class and get the test that they had taken particularly a student who was able to score successfully in that test. And so the, the players would get these tests, copies of these tests, and simply learn the answers and go into the class because they would get the old test and they could pass the test. And so John is saying, it is an old test that I'm giving to you. It's not new. And of course, the Old Testament talks about the great commandment. Jesus said in answer to the question, what is the greatest commandment? He answered with Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one God, and you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he took a verse from another passage in the Old Testament, and you're to love your neighbor as yourself. This makes up the great commandment. Jesus gave that as the answer to the question, what is 
the greatest commandment in all of the law. And truly, from the very beginning, God has desired our love. He seeks to have a love relationship with us. And the only way that we can truly have fellowship with God is to love Him. And that is to come into a personal relationship through the forgiveness of sin and turning our lives over to God. We then learn that by grace we can love God. We learn to love Him. And the Christian experience is one of growing in love for God. Wholehearted, total love for God. Now, of course, that's always something we're striving for. Because we don't always love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We don't always think about God as we should. We don't always live for God in devotion to God as we should. But yet, by grace, we strive and seek to love God. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. And, of course, that's very important. And Jesus gave an answer to the question in Luke chapter 10. Who is my neighbor? Jesus gave the story of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritan was one who was not really expected to be religious. And yet he was the one, not the religious leaders, but the Samaritan was one who really acted in love when he saw the man who had been beaten and left for dead. And he ministered to this man who had formerly been his enemy. And so Jesus gives this old test. And he says the great commandment is to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor. That includes anybody who has a need. But John is saying it's also a new commandment. It's a new test. Jesus has raised the bar. The expectations are now higher than God has of us. We must love everyone, including our enemies. Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus defines love as caring for even your enemies, those who despise you, those who wish you were dead, those who cheat against you. Those who are unfaithful to you, those who despise you, or those who snub you and ignore you. You are to love them. Now that is raising the bar. That's humanly impossible. That's possible only by grace through faith. Only those who come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior can truly exercise that with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now we can fabricate or we can sort of mimic love. But we can express genuine love only through our love relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why when the lawyer, that is the religious lawyer, asked Jesus, what is the great commandment? Jesus told him, loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, uh, and then he said, yeah, I agree. I answered correctly. But then he said to justify himself, Lord, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told that parable of the Good Samaritan. In other words, it's anybody including your enemy that you must love. Now, he was actually giving what we might call the plan of salvation. And it sounds like salvation by works, doesn't it? When you say, if you love your enemy, you're in the kingdom. Well, no. What Jesus is really saying is, when you know Christ, when you're saved by grace, when your heart has been transformed, you'll act like this. This kind of action is possible only through a dynamic in you where you have been loved and forgiven and you know because you've experienced love and forgiveness and the acceptance of a holy God that you're now obligated to love others. How can you shut out anyone when God hasn't shut you out of His love? We cannot exclude anyone because as Paul says in Romans 5, when we were sinners, when we were enemies of God, He loved us. He gave His Son for us. To be our Savior. This is the love of God. This is God-like love. And when we know God, we receive that love. And we express that love toward other people. And so this is the old and the new test. Do we have that kind of love for others? But it's also a true and a false test. And this is what he's saying in verses 9 and 10. True and false. I kind of like true and false tests because even if you weren't prepared, you had maybe a 50% chance of giving the right answer. You mean you, you, you don't know anything about the subject or the answer you're to give. And so, what are you going to mark? Well, maybe there's a chance. I don't know really, but I'll try true or I'll try false. Maybe I'll answer them all true and maybe that'll at least give me a passing grade or I'll answer them all false. But so here you have a true-false sort of situation. 
If I am a child of the light, I can ignore other people. I cannot love others. Well, that's clearly a false answer. That truly asks and demands a false answer. John is saying, you cannot claim to be a child of the light and not love your brother or sister. So the answer to that is false. There are people who think, well, you know, I can be a Christian as long as I believe the right things, as long as I go to Mayville Gateway Community Church, as long as I don't uh, have a bad reputation, uh, get caught uh, for drunk driving, as long as I'm a good citizen and exercise my right to vote, as long as I take care of myself and uh, I, I can make it, as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. And there are religions, by the way, who teach that. If on the day of judgment, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, then you'll make it into paradise or into the kingdom, whatever that kingdom might be. But what John says is, if you're missing out on love, if you fail to love anyone, if you cut off anyone from your love relationship and your willingness to love, then you're running into trouble. You can't be sure that you're passing the test. And so you must answer false. Now, to not love, somebody said that lovelessness can be soft. It isn't always having animosity uh, or being antagonistic or doing everything you can to uh, be hurtful and hateful to someone. Love can simply be indifference. Uh, love can be the refusal to uh, forgive and be forgiven and holding bitterness in your heart. Uh, lovelessness can be simply the unwillingness unwillingness to reach out in concern and care for someone else and in action uh, lovelessness has a soft approach sometimes a subtle approach and not many people but we ourselves can see it lovelessness can exist within a church fellowship the unwillingness to reach out to an errant member someone who may have something against you um, or someone against you, against whom you may have something, hold a grudge and have a problem with. And so there are a lot of ways that we can be loveless, even to our brother and sister in Christ. But then there's a true answer here in this verse 10. A true believer loves. A child of the light really loves and really cares. The answer is true. The answer is true. Jesus told some very important parables. I think of Matthew chapter 7. I think of Matthew chapter 25 on the day of judgment, the sheep and the goats. And when Jesus said, uh, those who visited me when I was in prison, those who visited me when I was sick, um, those are the ones, those are my sheep uh, who will enter into the kingdom. And so the question is, well, Lord, when did we see you in prison or naked? are in distress. Um, we, ne we never saw that, but Jesus said, no, when you saw anyone in need, your response was to care, to give, to serve, to love. And in that way, you were ministering to me. And on the judgment, I will say, come into the kingdom prepared for you. Those who refuse to love, depart from me. Matthew chapter 7. Those who just had words, who had Professions of faith, but not possessions of faith. I'll say, depart from me. I, I never knew you. Now, now, those are really sobering words for us. It almost sounds like salvation by works, doesn't it? It almost sounds like, uh, well, I've talked about some other religions that say you've got to have so many good works to outweigh your bad deeds. But no, you know what this is really saying is, when you have the genuine thing, the genuine article, it's going to reveal itself. When, you, when you've really been saved by God's mercy, love, and forgiveness, and grace, you never get over it. It gets into your character. It changes the way you see things and think about things. It's certainly the way you see people and think about people. It just changes you. You're a different person. 
In other words, we're saved by grace and the mercy and goodness of God. But, dare, dare I say this, we will be judged by works. Now that's amazing. God is so confident that His grace will change us that He says, on the judgment day, I'm just going to judge you by what I see. Because there will be a difference in your life. An indelible, unmistakable, absolutely consistent difference in the character of your life. And so, saved by grace. But then on the day of judgment, there will be works that will testify to that grace. That will give evidence and proof of that grace. Sobering thought indeed. But it's a test. It's the love test, which is finally a pass or fail test. That's in verses 10 and 11. Now, pass and fail. But usually I kind of like those tests too. Because that means the teacher graded on a curve. You know what that means. Uh, it means that instead of the absolute standard of you know, 95 to 100 is A and whatever is B and C and D and then failure below 70 or whatever it happens to be, what you do is you take the best performance in the, in the class. In other words, let's say it's a tough test, everybody did horribly, but the smartest person in the class maybe scored 75%. So that becomes your standard for excellence, okay, 75%. So then it's possible that you could score only 40% and still pass because the standard is lowered. The standard for every grade is lowered. But unfortunately, God doesn't grade on a curve. The pass or fail is absolute. That is sobering. And that's what he's saying in these last two verses. The passing grade is a life that doesn't cause anyone to stumble, including yourself. He, he uses the word skandalon, the Greek word, which really means a stumbling block. And, and in your life, you need to examine, is there a stumbling block in my life? One that causes me to stumble, and one that causes other people to stumble. Is there something about my life that is scandalous before God, before others, and even before myself? There's an offense, a stone of offense, Jesus talks about. Is there this offensive stone, this part of my character that needs to be dealt with, that can keep me from the kingdom of heaven? And so we examine, we search our hearts, we pray, we ask, Lord, do I truly know you? Am I standing on the solid rock? Jesus is the solid rock. In other words, that stone of stumbling can be a stepping stone of grace. Lord Jesus, have I found you as my only and true Lord and Savior? And am I building my life upon you, the solid rock? Am I arming myself, clothing myself with the armor of God that Paul talks about in Ephesians 6? So that when the evil day comes, when temptations come and trials come, I'm standing on the solid rock. There in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20, he describes the armor of God. And he says, be able to stand firm then on the evil day. Am I standing firm on the true rock, Jesus Christ? Is my life being built upon the firm foundation of Jesus Christ? Then if so, you will pass. If not, you will fail. A stone of stumbling, causing yourself, yourself to stumble, causing others to stumble. You need to ask yourself that question. Is my life an offense to other people? Examine yourself. The way you're walking and relating in faith, the way you're either living for God or not, will be either a stepping stone for others or a stumbling block to others. Sadly, there are those who profess faith in Jesus Christ, who claim to be Christians, who are parts of evangelical churches, who are causing family members to stumble, children to stumble, because the children are the first to detect hypocrisy. And they know if your life is either consistent and godly, or if you're not practicing what you preach. It'd be better for you to suffer a mortal death 
and you cause someone else to stumble. And so we examine ourselves. Lord, have I passed this test or am I causing others to stumble, leading others astray? And therefore we'll incur judgment because of that. And so we need to truly examine and be sure that when we stand on that day, we'll not hear Jesus say, depart from me. I never knew you. So this is a sobering test, isn't it? You know, uh, even good teachers, even the best, kindest teachers in the world, eventually, if you don't perform, you're not going to pass. I mean, even the dumbest jocks, you know, athletes, uh, you know, can, can, can plead and they can beg the, the teacher and the teacher can eventually uh, be sympathetic and say, well, I'm so sorry, but you, you can't pass. I mean, you, you didn't do anything right. You didn't do anything to deserve a passing grade. Even though you can't play football next season, you're academically ineligible. Even the kindest teacher cannot pass somebody who doesn't perform in the classroom at any level, you see. And so before God, I think we all have to say, Lord, I have failed. I, of my own, I, I can't pass. And this test is way above my performance level. It's so good to know that God is gracious. And it's so good to know that the teacher here, John himself, was a failure. He was one of the sons of thunder in his brother James. They were the guys that uh, when Jesus was excluded from a certain, uh, passing through a certain part of Samaria, they said, Lord, call down fire from heaven and destroy these people. You know, he was a son of thunder. He was probably temperamental. And uh, he was one of these real zealots. And, and yet God transformed John into becoming the beloved disciple, this tender-hearted pastor. Can you imagine how his heart was changed? by the grace and the goodness of God. He, he and his brother also were ambitious. They got their mother to say to Jesus, well, these boys of mine, they've been such good disciples. Lord, why don't you give them a special place in heaven? Let them sit at your right and your left. Let them be your first lieutenants in your kingdom. They were ambitious. They put their mother up to that. Their mother didn't come up with that idea. They put their mother up to that idea because they thought Jesus would do what their mother wanted them. Well, they were changed. Uh, James became the first martyr of the church, faithful witness. John, faithful, beloved disciple, his heart was changed. The good thing is, the good news is, God gives us a second chance. He's the God of the second chance. And even though we've performed miserably, he's able to give us grace to make an A, perform well. It doesn't mean that we'll ever be perfect in this life. It just means that when we trust in Jesus Christ, He comes into our lives, He transforms our hearts, He gives us a desire to hunger, thirst for righteousness, and to be A students. Not, not to prove how good we are, but simply because we love God. And, and we want to love others. And we want to have this joyful assurance that we belong to God, because we know that we wouldn't normally love people. It's just not in us. We know it's only by grace that we were able to become children of light. How much time have I gone over? Lots of time. Lots of time. <laughs> well, I'll be short. Um, by grace, we become children of light. We become the very best in the eyes of God. He delights in us. Um, down in Kentucky, there's a place called Mammoth Cave. And through that cave runs a river called Echo River. In that river, in that deep, dark cave, uh, there are fish. They have no eyes. I suppose for millennia, of course, these fish have not needed eyes because they're in total darkness. They couldn't see anyway. So finally, the eye sockets just have no eyes. They lost the need for eyes. Now, there's no way these fish could see because they have no eyes. And, and I compare this to how we, by grace, become the children of light. Even though we failed and become so spiritually blinded that there's no more capacity, it's great to know that grace overcomes our darkness, overcomes our failure. 
It gives us light to see. I love that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. How that we, in darkness, have received the light of God. By the grace of God, light has shone into our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So, by grace, we've been able to see Jesus, to know He loves us, to realize that we're sinners apart from Him, and gives us this grace to seek His mercy and forgiveness, turn from our sin, turn our lives over to Christ, and we're transformed into the likeness of Jesus. That's by grace. That's His work in us, to transform us. And that's what He will do for each one of us. He wants to do that for each one of us. He wants to make every student an A student in His eyes. Again, it doesn't mean you have to perform to perfection. It means you have to grow in Christ's likeness. It means you have to do what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It uses that Greek present. But keep on growing. Keep on learning. Keep on striving after righteousness. Keep on enjoying God more and more. Living more in His presence. Keep on receiving the assurance of your salvation that you truly are a child of God because you know it wasn't you that prompted you to care for that person. It wasn't you that enabled you to say a word of kindness to that person who had taken advantage of you. It wasn't you who allowed you to be sweet and kind and forgiving and prayerful in heavy traffic when somebody jumped in front of you who took the best parking place you were looking for as you were on your way to the supermarket. It wasn't you to be kind in those circumstances and situations that really tested and tried your patience. It wasn't you that caused you to be loving, loving and kind towards your husband when he didn't do what he claimed to do and give what he had claimed to give and fulfilled every vow that he had made to you. It wasn't you who enabled you to forgive him and to even have love for him and to love more than ever before. It was grace. It was Christ. It's his love in you, working through you. And so we live on that level of the love of Christ. And that's how we pass the love test. Okay? Let's pray and ask God to enable us to pass the love test. You know, you took the survey and you've taken tests throughout your life. You took a driver's test just like I did. But now we seek to find the grace of God to enable us to pass the love test, this most important of all tests. Lord, we do thank you that you're a gracious and wonderful God. We thank you for the teachers you've given us like John. We thank you for the way that you call us to examine ourselves, to be certain that we're in the faith. You want us to have absolute assurance that we belong to you. And Father, you want to be glorified through lives of love as we learn to love you with our whole being and love our neighbor as ourselves. And so we give ourselves to you, Lord. By grace through faith, we trust that you're working in us to make us more like Jesus. That you're giving us love beyond our own capacity to love and care. You're making us aware of those around us who have need of your love. You're making us aware of opportunities every day to share the love of Christ in simple ways. You're making us aware, Father, that through us, your light shines throughout the city of Mayville, Horicon, Dodge County, Wisconsin, and even through being missional people, the words, the light is going out into all the world. And so we thank you for the privilege of being your children. So this is our prayer. God's people who agree, say together. Amen. 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 Jim, come and uh, conclude, unless you have another test. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Roberts. Um, last week I mentioned a book that I was reading as part of a Bible study that we're in. Um, not a fan, and I couldn't remember the author's name. If you were wondering what that was, it's Kyle Eidelman. If you were interested in that, I recommend the book highly. Um, yes, if you want to, it is in the library. Great. Um, check it out. It's in the library. Um, it's it's a great book. If you want to be tested, it's it's a book that will test you and challenge you. Um, and that's really the way we grow. Is is through being tested. Um, a song that came to my mind as Pastor Roberts was um, preaching to the um, the lyrics are "But you love me anyway." Whether we fail or not, God still loves us. That's one thing that we can always be certain of. 
So as we go from here today, remember that. And remember that when someone cuts you off in traffic or cuts you off in traffic. Or they might cut you off in traffic. <laughs> I'm at least 10 times when I'm coming back and forth from work a week, I have to deal with this detour. People think because it's a detour, people, everybody's gonna follow the detour, but I live down the road, so I go straight. And so it's kind of like a demolition derby when you're trying to go through that intersection. So that's one that I need to be reminded of. But that's, you're over that right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm over that. <laughs> so um, don't forget, search committee meeting with Dr. Perry on Tuesday night, 6.30. Um, five o'clock Wednesday night, um, church cleaning and preparing the ministry center to become, once again, our Sunday worship center. So 10 o'clock also on Sundays downtown. If you come here next week and you're wondering where everybody is, come downtown. Come downtown. All right. Let's uh, just thank God for today and um, ask us to bless them through the this week. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the message today um, we thank you that um, you love us enough that you do test us Lord and that we will continue to grow through um, being as um, it says in Proverbs um, sharpened like iron Lord we just um, thank you that you continue to pour your blessings out on us help us as we move forward as um, Gateway Community Church Lord that you just continue to use us to further your kingdom. Bless us throughout this week, and we pray this all in your son's name. Amen.